Back in 2006, I found myself in Singapore teaching a private guitar student. And in, initially, I was traveling from Helsinki to Singapore, backwards and forwards. But after a, a few trips, we decided I would stay there for a few weeks at a time to teach this student. And one evening, I found myself uh, watching the news late at night. BBC was on the TV. I was half asleep. The newsreader was talking about something about Indonesia, about forest fires. And suddenly he stopped and he said, oh, I have some breaking news. And he put his hand to his ear, his earpiece and said, I have breaking news that North Korea has launched its test nuclear missiles. And I became really curious for some reason. I, I ended up researching on internet about North Korea, music, about their customs, about all kinds of history. I found myself writing an email to the British ambassador that night, about three in the morning. So I wrote him a very simple email. Uh, Dear sir, my name is Jason Carter. I'm a guitarist. I've been working for the British Council, doing concerts um, in places such as Afghanistan and Mozambique and so and so. Uh, I'm really interested in coming to North Korea to play a concert, to do a collaboration if possible. What do you think? Music can be a really powerful platform for intercultural dialogue. Best wishes from Jason. I thought he won't reply, you know, come on. Well, after a couple of days, I received a reply from him and he said, Dear Mr. Carter, thank you for your very unusual email. You are the first person that's asked to come to North Korea. However, I understand your idea, but we are not in a position to organize any cultural activities for various reasons. First of all, it's not allowed. However, the North Korean government do invite artists once a year for a festival. So if you want, I can make the connection for you, introduce you to the government, and then step out of the equation and you can then communicate with them directly. So I agreed and I sent my CDs, my DVDs to the Foreign Office in London. It went to North Korea eventually. This was October and I heard nothing for weeks, weeks and weeks and weeks. I thought, oh, well, you know, it was worth a try. Christmas 2006, I was in Spain with my parents uh, on holiday. It was Boxing Day and my phone rang. It was an unknown number. I thought, oh, it's a friend from Dubai or Singapore or someone wishing me Merry Christmas. So I answered the phone. I said, hello. And a very strange voice a distant, strange voice on the end of the phone said, Oh, hello, Mr. Carter. I said, hello. And he said, Oh, hello, I'm calling from North Korean Embassy in London. And uh, I understand you want to come to North Korea to play a concert with your guitar. I said, well, yes, that would be interesting. How does one go about doing that? And these were his exact words. He said, first of all, you have to come to the embassy so we can deepen the intimacy with you. And so we made a, a, a date for our intimacy deepening experience. And I found myself at the North Korean embassy in London a few weeks later. Now, most embassies are grand buildings in the center of capital cities. But the North Korean embassy is a sort of an end terraced house in Ealing Broadway in West London, which is a, you know, a suburb. It wasn't easy to find. And I found myself standing outside this house looking quite auspicious to be honest, all the curtains were closed, it looked a bit unloved and there was a golden plaque saying the embassy of the DPRK, the Democratic People's Republic of Korea. So I opened the gate and there was cameras and I walked in and I knocked on the door. The door swung open quickly and there was a smiling happy North Korean man. Ah oh, Mr. Qatar, welcome. I walked in and of course Every embassy is the property or the territory of the country that you're visiting. So for the first time, I was actually in North Korean territory. My first impressions were the house was very musty, the paintings were very um, old fashioned, and there were photo very badly taken photographs of the axes of evil leaders that North Korea are friendly with. So there was a picture of Yasser Arafat, Kamal Gaddafi, Saddam Hussein, and others. And I was sort of ushered into a small sitting room and the coffee table was plastered with North Korean propaganda, these like r bright red magazines, and depicting the wonderful life in North Korea. The man who brought me in sort of told me to wait, bought me some tea, and I sat there for a while by myself. There was a little camera in the corner. So I waited patiently, and finally, the North Korean ambassador to London came in. Now, he was a very quiet, uh, short man with glasses and quite serious. And he sat to my right and the other man sat to my left. So general questions about my life and about music and um, 
and they, they were sort of expressing how, how interested they, they were to receive someone to play music and how important music is in terms of bridge building. So it was all very positive. Anyway, the North Korean ambassador had my CV that I printed or I'd sent my email, he printed out and all my you know, experience was there. And he was sort of looking through it. And at one point he looked at my CV and he said, oh, Mr. Carter, I can see that you like to visit axes of evil countries. And there was a silence and he looked at me and he said, welcome to North Korea. All you see on TV are images of marching soldiers and, and missiles and tanks. And everyone looks so serious. And so it was nice to, uh, to, to experience a humor. It makes a connection with people. And so we started laughing about this. They were all, all, almost laughing at themselves about the reputation. So I continued to ask them very direct questions about the possibilities and how life would be for me for those two weeks or 10 days in North Korea. So I said, can I collaborate with North Korean musicians, which is really important. And they said, yes. I said, um, can I walk freely in the streets without a guide, without a translator, or just by myself? They said, yes. And everything I asked was yes. I thought, wow, that's contrary to what we are led to believe. Now, this was the first of, I think, four meetings that I had to attend at, at the embassy just to have more conversations about the trip. Now, the Finnish government had sponsored my ticket as a goodwill gesture for making connections, but I couldn't buy the ticket until I knew the dates and had a visa. So it was now 10 days before the festival started and I still had no ticket and no visa. I was called late at night by my counterpart at the embassy, very excited. He said, Mr. Carter, your visa is ready. Can you come tomorrow morning to collect it? I said, sure, great. So I booked my ticket. I booked a Lufthansa ticket from Helsinki to Beijing. And then from Beijing, there would be an Air Corio flight, which is North Korean Airlines flight to Pyongyang. Now, the British ambassador had emailed me um, a week before that and said, Dear Jason, just a curious, how are you getting to North Korea? Because the airline doesn't have a great safety record. They only have two planes, and one is for spares and one is for flying. And the one that flies backwards and forwards does catch fire on a regular basis. And so I asked the embassy if I could go by train. I thought, wow, it'd be awesome to go from, by Beijing to Pyongyang by train. But apparently it takes weeks to organize because they need security, they need a, a, um, a guide, a, a, a sort of an entourage to accompany you. So it wasn't possible. So I had to take this flight. So I got to the embassy to get my passport back and my visa. And they opened the door and I went in and had more tea and more chat. And I presumed that because they were paying my ticket and sponsoring, sorry, because they were sponsoring the trip, that the visa would be free. And so I said, do, do I have to pay for the visa? And they said, oh yes, you have to pay for the visa. I said, well, how much is it? And they said, oh, it's between 20 and 50 pounds. I said, well, is it 20 or 50 pounds? And he said, 50 pounds. <laughs> so I paid my 50 pounds, got my passport and visa. And I never forget the look of this guy as I left the embassy. Every time I went to visit the embassy, they would say goodbye to me, they'd walk into the garden, but they would never come beyond the gate. And I think that it's, they weren't really allowed to go very far from the embassy. So I'll never forget the words of this guy as he waved goodbye from the embassy door. And I said goodbye and I turned around and said, Mr. Carter, he said, wait. I said, what? He said, you're going to be very famous in North Korea. And it's unusual, I slept deeply all the way from Munich to Beijing, which is unusual. I, I, I went into a deep sleep, I woke up as the plane was landing at Beijing airport. And my instructions were, it was very 007, very James Bond. My instructions were to arrive at Beijing airport before midday on this day and wait for a signal for my flight to North Korea because North Korean Airlines doesn't have official flights, it's all private. So I went through customs and I found myself at a coffee place um, at Beijing airport and Beijing airport was a big airport and I found myself talking to an American guy who was going to South Korea he said where are you going I said I'm going to North Korea and he said you're joking I said yeah yeah I'm going he said how are you getting there I said well, I don't really know I'm waiting for a signal from them to get my flight <laughs> surely enough by about one o'clock in the afternoon after about an hour of landing there was an announcement on the tannoy all artists coming for the uh, festival in North Korea, in Pyongyang, please come to meeting point number one. So I have my guitar, my suitcase, because I had to bring it through. 
I went to this meeting point and I was met by a very entertaining and very interesting group of people. First of all, there were three North Korean men in suits with very strange haircuts, with little, little red badges, with Kim Jong-il's uh, picture. He was the leader at the time. And there was a Russian Cossack dancing group, the Mongolian military orchestra, and me, uh, and also a Bollywood dance troupe. It was like Noah's Ark, like two by two, let's take the random you know, people from the world and put them on this plane to North Korea. And this man thrust a boarding card into my hand, no return ticket. I said, where's my return ticket? He said, oh, you'll get your return ticket when you get there. I said, I'd like to have it now. And he said, no, no, it's just the one way now. So I had to make a quick decision. Do I want to go to North Korea on a one-way ticket? And the, the thought entered my mind, is that a good idea? But I thought, that's oh, okay, it's okay. So I gave my suitcase, he gave me my boarding card. He said, go through security now. So I went through security, it was very busy. Beijing is crazy. I find myself at the passport window to exit China. And I gave my boarding card and my name was spelled wrong. It said Jason, J-E-I-S-O-N. And the guy looked at me and he said to me, so where are you going? I said, I'm going to Pyongyang, North Korea. And he said, good luck. He stepped my boarding card, my passport and said, off you go. So I found my gate and I looked out the window and I saw this awesome looking, very retro 50s, red and white plane, rusty as anything, um, going to North Korea. So I got on the plane, um, bright, everything was bright red inside. There were various kinds of people on the plane, my Bollywood dance troupe, the Mongolian military orchestra, the Russian Cossack dancers, and a bunch of other people, and some North Koreans. I found my seat and I sat there and thought to myself, is this the right thing to do? I, I still wasn't sure. I'm now on the plane, I can't go back, you know. My luggage is there, I'm going to North Korea on a one-way ticket. The engine started up and the plane taxied away and off we went. And we were, we were given these wonderful, uh, magazines of how wonderful the life was in North Korea, how wonderful the leader was. It was all very, very badly taken photographs of a very dismal looking place. The flight lasted about two and a half hours and I was chatting to the guy next to me. He seemed to be working for UNICEF. Um, I had a little sleep and we were, seatbelts came on and we descended into Pyongyang. Most of the incidents that happened with North Korean Airlines Air Koryo happened on landing. So I was kind of alert, but it was fine. We landed and we swung around and the airport, it was a very gray, cloudy morning. And North Korea, I mean, I've been to, some, I've been to Russia and, and some of the Eastern Bloc states and it reminded me of, of that, but even more extreme. Um, foggy, old fashioned. And the first thing that happened was, was awesome. I love to make films, of course, and the door opened and we sort of, you know, were channeled out of the plane. And the first thing I saw were around eight guys and girls with these awesome big cameras from the 50s with tape inside them. It was amazing. And I came down the steps, I think it was almost first, and I had no idea what to expect, who was meeting me, where I was staying. There was no information given. So I'm just, you know, here I am. And we were sort of ushered into a group by the side of the plane. And I never forget, the Bollywood dance troupe were so excited about coming to North Korea. They're doing this sort of Bollywood movements down the, I should have filmed it, it was very funny. And a very short um, lady of about 25 years old, very, very friendly, said, ah, Mr. Carter, you are Jason. I said, I am. She said, I'm your translator. I said, oh, nice to meet you. So they took me through customs and they checked my laptop for, um, for satellite emitting devices or whatever. Um, I had two phones and they were confiscated, well, confiscated, they were left at the airport in a safety deposit box, so I couldn't call anybody. And we were met by a driver in a big old Russian Volga car. Now, I've been in one of these cars once in Russia and they're awesome, it's like being in a boat. They're in like limousines, they're really big, but the suspension is dodgy. So you'd sort of drift around corners like you're in, a, in an old rowing boat, you know, it's very funny. I was transfixed by the sights that I saw um, they were trying to distract me from looking, to be honest. So I had a guide who was a policeman and my translator and a driver. They were sitting with me in the back of the car. And I was just, you know, I'm curious. I was excited. I want to see this country. And what I saw were um, 
people in fields pulling ploughs manually. So there were like long chains of men and women looking very thin, pulling ploughs through fields and then run down buildings with smashed glass and no windows and everything was grey and grey and grey. They were trying to distract me and trying to tell me about my trip, but I was like, wow, this is interesting. So they were giving me the programme of my trip, kind of the rough outline in the car. So I got to my hotel, the Pyongyang Hotel, and there are three hotels in, North, in, in Pyongyang. One is the Pyongyang Hotel. There's one on an island where foreigners normally stay so they can monitor them. And the, the oldest hotel, which is a big one in the centre. This one was full of North Koreans. I was the only foreigner in the hotel. They're very welcoming. Uh, a bit musty, everything was a bit musty, a bit damp, you know, unlived in, uncared for, to be honest, but very friendly. I checked in and to be honest, the first thing I wanted to do was have a look around. I was like in North Korea, for goodness sake. So I got to my room, I unpacked a little bit, had a bit of a wash and thought, I'm going out. I had not been told otherwise that I couldn't do that. So I just came down in the lift and walked out the door without thinking about it and my camera. I got maybe 20 metres down the street towards the children's playground. I saw a bunch of children playing unaccompanied without, without adults. And suddenly two men arrived at my each side and took my arm friendly but forcefully and said, um, oh, Mr Carter, um, you can't go outside the hotel. I said, why not? Well, because you might get lost and no one speaks English and you might never come back. I said, come on. I said, you're, you're joking, right? I mean, I'm, I'm, a, I'm an adult. I, I, can, I know where I'm going, I, I can see where the hotel is. He said, no, no, I'm sorry. And that was a kind of more of a squeeze. Please come back to the hotel. I thought, oh, great, you know, 10 days or 12 days like this. I thought, that's not good. So I went back to my hotel. The British ambassador called me and welcomed me personally to Pyongyang. I think I was the only other British person in the country apart from him and his team. So that was nice. He said, anytime Here's my phone number. You can call me from the hotel. If you have any, any problems, just let me know. Thank you very much, that's very nice. So um, around three o'clock in the afternoon, a car came to pick me up to go to the concert venue. I was driven with my guitar to this awesome opera house, really beautiful. Everything in North Korea is old. They have, because of sanctions, they have not been able to renew anything for years. So the place was in gorgeous condition, all wood and lovely acoustics, very grand. I found a big old Russian microphone on a stand in the center of the stage and I jumped on stage and got my guitar out and sat down and played for a minute or two. It sounded amazing. And so I was about to put my guitar away and there were four or five um, men in military uniforms sitting just in front of me down in, in the auditorium. And they said, oh, Mr. Carter, uh, please, can you, um, can you play your concert program for us? so we can make sure that your music is suitable for the North Korean people. I said, okay. I said, I sent you a CD, a CD and a DVD in the post last year and you've invited me and obviously you've heard my music, but sure. So I played very short versions of these pieces. To be honest, I started playing and they weren't interested, they weren't listening, they were just talking. And I thought, well, stuff that. So I just played through them quickly and finished with a very short, lively Spanish guitar piece, which would get their attention normally. And I finished and I thought, no, no reaction. So I put my guitar away and I went and sat with them. I said, so is everything okay? Was, was that all right? Are you happy? And one of the men looked at me and he said, oh, Mr. Carter, we have a problem. I said, what might that problem be? Uh, your music is not suitable for the North Korean people. And I started laughing. I've never arrived in a concert venue to be told that my music is not suitable for anybody. It's ridiculous. I mean, it's the most harmless music you can think of. It's instrumental, it's quite reflective. But that was the problem, it was reflective. And North Koreans are only exposed to this triumphant, vibrant music which praises their country and praises their leader. So much hope for so many people, which can bring to this world lasting peace for all nations and happiness and well being for all men. Yeah. 
So I laughed nervously for a minute or so, thinking, what, how do I respond to that? I had a one-way ticket, I couldn't leave the country. Only two flights per week on Tuesdays and Saturdays. I'm stuck, you know. So I said, well, what do you suggest I do? I looked up and on the balcony, there was a big banner and it said in Korean and in English, North Korea welcomes our international artists for this festival, bringing the world together or bridging the world together through music. I was like, what's that? I said, I've come all this way to play my music for you at my own expense, I have to add. No one's paying me to do this. And here is a lovely banner explaining why I'm here and you're telling me I can't do what I'm supposed to be doing. What's, what's all that about? I started to get a bit angry, to be honest. And I said, so what should we do? I, I'm not gonna go, I can't go home. And I'm come all this way, what should we do? And the man looked at me and I never forget this. He said, we, we think the best solution for you is if you can play British military songs. I said, you are joking. And then I became actually quite angry, to be honest, because it's obvious that I, I mean, I was just naive, I, I guess. It's obvious that I've been brought there under false pretenses and all they were interested in is a British guy being on stage to show on TV, to show how Britain was friendly with North Korea and how they supported Kim Jong-il. Now, friends had warned me about this. They said to me, Jason, you will be used as a tool for propaganda. Every dollar you spend in North Korea will go into the pockets of the leaders and, and you're supporting the regime by going. But I argued that and I said each time, you're right, you're absolutely right. But if nobody goes to North Korea, then what difference can be made? Now, not that me playing the guitar in North Korea will change the world, it cannot. But music can change atmospheres. The presence of, 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 of foreigners can show people that there's another world outside those borders. And that's the reason why I went. And I still stand by that reason. But in this moment, when I was, when I was asked to play British military songs, I thought to myself, get me out of here now, you know. At that point, I started to say, you know, you cannot do this. You cannot invite me all this way to, uh, under false pretenses and tell me to do this. And I was quite angry, to be honest. Well, there was a bit of discussion amongst them. I, I walked away and sat on stage thinking, I couldn't call anybody, I couldn't do anything. I thought, what do I do? So I'm sitting there thinking there's got to be a solution. And then they had a little meeting and one of the guys came on stage and said, Mr. Carter, we have a solution. Your music is very beautiful and you can play these pieces, it's okay. I said, okay, thank you very much. Next day was the concert day. And we had, there were many artists performing in the, at the Opera House that night. It was a long program, I think three hours. Anyway, so I have very strict instructions. Um, my time came to perform. I was backstage by the curtain. Suddenly this policeman came, my policeman guide friend, and he was always very aggressive and very, very, he almost shouted at me like in a military way. And he said, Carter. I said, yes. He said, uh, you cannot talk to the audience, not allowed. I said, okay. Now for me, making contact with the audience is so important because they get to see that you're like them, you're human. And also it helps me relax. So I would generally speak for a minute before I play. I would explain what the guitar is, um, maybe tell a short story, just to get myself relaxed and to also put the audience at ease. So, and he said, you go to stage when your name is called, you take a bow, sit down, no talking, play the pieces, stand up, take a bow, come off stage. I said, yes, sir. Okay. So this lady came on stage. I could see her, the curtain wasn't completely closed. I could see her. Now, if you've seen North Korean television, and all of us have seen it at some point on the news, where there's a lady and she's like, and she's like, telling the news in a triumphant way. It's kind of energetic and triumphant and victorious, like their music, like the way they present themselves. So I heard my name mentioned a few times, but of course I don't understand Korean. And she was like, and it went on for like five minutes. I mean, what is she saying about me? Obviously she's making it up because <laughs> there's nothing that she can know about me that, that lasts that long. And finally I heard the finale of the introduction and the curtain opened and the guy almost sort of shoved me onto stage and I sort of walked on the stage. I sat down and I think it is possibly the most unusual, magical, bizarre moment of my life on stage. I sat down and looked at a sea of 3,000 North Korean people, all in national dress, most of them. And the men had very drab looking grey, 
almost brown suits with the badges of Kim Jong-il with basin haircuts, they looked identical. The women in bright colours, the same bright colours, and it was amazing. I mean, bizarre. Now my hair was down here. I had a pair of orange flares with some kind of purple shirt with flowers on. I must have looked like some alien from outer space. And I never forget this moment of sitting there and the interaction between myself and them. And they're like, oh my gosh, what is that? And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, who are they? But I couldn't speak to them. So I, I sat there for a moment and I went, and they all went like that. And they sort of, you know, sort of smiled and laughed a little bit. So I started playing a piece called The Colour of Silence. The Colour of Silence is a, a tapping piece. So I start tapping with my left hand, which, which enables me to, to get used to the acoustics, to feel the audience. It's a piece I know so, so well. And it's also a, a piece which is quite technical and it will impress the audience, of course. It's quite musical, but it gives me the space to not think about what I'm doing and to make contact with people. I started doing this tapping very quietly. It gets louder and louder and louder and lasts quite a long time. It's about a minute or so. Well, for them, this is like outrageous. They've never seen someone play guitar like that. The guitar was banned in North Korea until just before then as a Western instrument. No, it's not, but so to see this guy, my hair was like draping over the guitar, you know, doing this thing. For them, it was like, my gosh, what's he doing? You know, and they started like, and there's kids in the front row, like, they're going, wow, this, like, wow. For me, that was a magical moment. Now, music is an amazing thing. The atmosphere that music can create is incredible. But in a situation like, or a place like North Korea, where the atmosphere is so stressful, where people are brainwashed, where the atmosphere is so di dictatorial, when you bring some creativity into that, even just for a moment, it changes things, it touches people, it's amazing. And so I'm starting playing and the reaction of the kids, especially I could see the kids in the front row, they were quite close to me. And they're like, like this, like, wow, what's he doing? And that for me is, if, if that was the only thing that happened in my whole trip that in terms of impact, that would be enough because what in that example, you're showing somebody that you can do something differently. now. Of course, for them, they're not allowed to think differently. They can't do anything differently. But one day, North Korea will change. And if one of those boys who sat in the front row, if something in his way of thinking changed about how I played the guitar and how I dressed, that led him to believe there was a world outside those borders that was different than what he understood, that's magic, amazing. I remember when I was around eight years old at school, a theater company came to my school. Now, I'd never seen a theatre company, I lived in the countryside. These guys came to this school, they were full of energy, they were crazy, they had dreadlocks, they had bright clothes, and they were mad, completely mad. The energy they had, now I don't remember what they did, but I remember the impact it had on me. These people are different, they're not like my family, or from the people in this village, and there's a world outside this village that is different, and it, it inspired me. And I remember that at that moment. So, I did my concert, and it was really hard not to talk to the audience, I couldn't talk to them. And it was really difficult because I wanted to make contact. Anyway, I did my pieces and the, the response was amazing. Standing ovation, the energy that came from the audience was amazing, amazing, very touching. I took my bow, left the stage, I was ushered into my dressing room and there waiting for me were three female journalists in military outfits with these reel-to-reel -reel tape recorders, very cute. This was the first time I felt really welcome in North Korea because they were so happy and they were so excited. And they said, oh, Mr. Carter, your music was so wonderful. And, and people love you so much and you, you're bringing something new to the people. And so first, for the first time in those two days, I felt, wow, that's awesome. And because they know how hard it is to get into North Korea. They know all the issues that a Westerner faces to get a visa. So the appreciation in that moment was awesome. It was enough. So they had questions. Now, the three journalists, but only one newspaper, which is unusual, uh, a bit unusual, why were there three, but anyway. So they had a list of my pieces on a piece of paper with my bio so they could have a, a basis from which to ask questions about the concert, about my life generally. And 
The first question was, um, oh, Mr. Carter, piece number three, it's called Horses Running Through the Desert. Tell us about this story. And I said, I don't have a piece called Horses Running Through the Desert. There must have been a mistake or a misprint, or maybe you've got a, a different concert program. And they sort of, oh, okay. What about piece number four? Kim Jong-il riding on big white horse. Oh, man, I burst out laughing. And I said, um, yeah, it's called that. <laughs> I know I said it wasn't, uh, but it was just very funny that, that they felt that they, they couldn't allow me to have these more reflective titles to this reflective music. And so they had to lead the audience into the, um, the idea that I was playing something which was supporting the country, which I found very funny, to be honest. For me, whatever you title a piece of music, it doesn't matter, to be honest, because an audience will always bring their own story to what you're doing. It might give them an, uh, an idea of, of something, but the music speaks for itself, so I wasn't really worried about that. I thought it was very funny. Every day I was hounded by journalists, and the more I asked to do certain things, like can I go to the metro, for instance, or can I go to this place, it was always no, 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 no. After four or five days, I started to, to do the same. So they, they wanted interviews every day to put on national television, and I said, sorry, no. No more interviews. And they were like, what? I said, I'm sorry, I don't want, I, I've done it like four days in a row. I don't want to do it anymore. You've got enough footage of me. There's enough, sorry, no. They were shocked, like really upset. No, not like angry, but like disappointed. Like, oh, you know. Days went by and it became increasingly um, tedious, to be honest. My, my guide, who was the policeman, was very stressful to be around. And there were these people were with me from the moment I went out of my hotel room until the moment I went to bed. So hours per day they were by my side. My translator was very friendly. She was awesome, amazing English, she was funny, but he was just very stressed, a chain smoking guy who was just very hard to be around. And what's really bizarre, he treated me like a child on a daily basis. So I started to behave like a child. It was really bizarre. One day we were in an open field. There were some mountains just outside Pyongyang. And they were, they were showing us some sports exhibition. It was very boring, to be honest. Kids jumping over hoops and things. It was very impressive. But after 10 minutes, you've seen enough. So I wandered off. I mean, there's nowhere I could go, you know. I wandered off slowly, you know, just to look around at the nature. And he was, he was like walking behind me, like, just like that. So I was like, what are you doing? He said, I'm, just, I'm following you. So I started running. You know, it was, it was very sort of Benny Hill, you know. I was like, I started running. He started running and I started sprinting. And he's a chain smoking guy, right? He's like, I said, look, what, where am I gonna go? You know, where, what can I do? I, I, I can't escape. Why would I want to run away in this area and not be able to get back to my hotel without you? Think about it, you know? And he's like, oh, okay, okay, okay. The next day, I thought, I've gotta get out of this hotel. I've gotta get out of this hotel, get me out of here. And so I made a plan. I thought, if I go to the lobby and sit in the lobby on one of those nice, nice chairs for a long time, they'll get used to me sitting there, they'll start to ignore me. Then I can just walk out. So what I did is very James Bond. I got a North Korean newspaper, which I couldn't read, of course. I took it. I sat in the corner and I opened it and I started reading it for ages like this. And the guys were watching me. They've been told, of course, to watch me. So they're watching me like this and smiling, of course. They were very friendly, but still doing their job. After maybe 20 minutes, they were distracted. A bus arrived full of North Korean soldiers checking into the hotel, and I slipped out. Now, I didn't want to cause an international uh, you know, incident. I didn't want to get arrested, of course. But all I wanted to do was walk the streets for half an hour and look around with my camera, you know. So I walked, car I didn't run away. I didn't want to cause a scene. I walked slowly, looked over my shoulder, and no one was following me. I thought, amazing. I got about, Five minutes down the road, I have to say, I didn't turn off. I didn't want to cause a problem. I didn't turn off. I headed for this awesome children's playground where there were kids playing. And the kids, they never see foreigners walking alone in the streets. Right? They were terrified. Well, some of them were terrified. My hair was blowing in the wind and uh, bright clothes. They're like alien to them, you know. And so I took my camera and there were these bunch of kids that either ran away for their lives or came up to me and said, take a picture. Well, in Korean, they couldn't speak English. So I'm snapping away, getting gorgeous pictures of children. It was, it was, and they were so friendly. Suddenly my guide had heard that I'd escaped the hotel and he was running down the road. Carter, get back here now, not allowed. 
And I turned around and said, stop right there. Stay where you are in the middle of the street. He stopped and I said, you know, I was so, I was so fed up, you know. Said, Leave me alone. I'm, you can stay there. You can watch me from there. But don't come and pull me and touch me and, you know, escort me anywhere. I'm not going to run away. I don't want to go to prison. But you told me when I arrived that you wanted to give me a good impression of your country and it's not going very well, you know. So he sat down looking quite ashamed of himself, to be honest. I felt bad for, because he's doing his job, basically. It, 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 I'm his responsibility. So I took a few more pictures and I thought, okay. I went back to him and I sat on the chair with him and I said, listen, let's lay, let's lay some ground rules. You have to understand, I'm not gonna run away. I don't wanna get into trouble, but I wanna feel like an adult. Don't pull me around, don't shout at me, and treat me like a human being, and that'll go very well for both of us. Do you understand? He said, okay, okay, I understand. I said, I'm really sorry. I said, look, I shook his hand. I said, I don't want to get into trouble, but I also want to feel free as much as I can, normal. He said, okay, I understand. From that moment onwards, it was much better. Um, he still was watching me, of course, at every move, um, but it became better. And also we started laughing about it, which is, which is quite funny. At night, I was left to my own devices in my room and there was a secret bar in the hotel I found by accident. No one told me it was there. One night I went out just to buy some biscuits and beer because that's all you could buy in the hotel lobby. Um, and I heard people, a, a, a large group of people were going up the stairs and obviously going on a mission somewhere. I thought, where are they going? That looks interesting. Soldiers, basically. So I you know, followed them a little bit, you know, kept my distance and they went into this room and there was a bar. I was like, wow. I walked in, all North Korean soldiers, and they had maybe four or five bottles of something very strong on the counter and a bunch of beers for sale. And they, they all looked at me like, what's he doing here? And I'm like, well, this is interesting. So I just went to the bar. I said, what have you got? They're, no English, of course. And they said, beer. I said, yes, give me a beer. So I took a beer and I thought, well, I'll just stay here and stand at the bar and maybe someone will talk to me, you know. So I'm standing at the bar with my beer thinking, well, shall I go and sit down? Who shall I talk to? Can I talk to these people? You know, what's the thing? At that moment, in walked, obviously, a very high-ranking North Korean soldier, official, general, I don't know what he was. The whole place stood up to attention. I was like, whoa, what's going on here? He saw me and he went, hello. I said, hello. And he came up to me and he shook my hand. And he said, drink with me. I said, okay. And I said, that. No, he said that, pointing to this bottle on the shelf, which had a snake inside of it. So he poured two very large shots of this stuff and it's yellow, like urine. It was disgusting, with bits of snake skin floating in it. You know, it was really disgusting. He said, drink one time. I said, okay. So I took this drink and I whacked it back with him. Cheers, you know, down and it burnt my throat. It was disgusting. And we had a chat in a very broken English. He was trying to ask me questions, but I, I didn't understand what he was talking about. We laughed and whatever. Another shot, knocked it back, very strong. By now I'm getting, by the way, the second drink was, I think it had a python. The first one was, I think it was, a, was something else. It was a, definitely a python, knocked it back. And I thought, okay, time to go to bed. So I said goodbye, everyone waved, oh, bye bye. You know, they're very friendly. Went to my room. Well, suffice to say, I had the worst diarrhea, the worst stomach you can imagine. I was awake all night on the toilet, feeling ill. And I thought that was a bad idea. At seven in the morning, my phone rang in my hotel room. I was like, hello. I was feeling rough. It was my translator. Ah, oh, Mr. Carter, Jason, we have a surprise for you. I said, um, I'm not really sure if I'm up for a surprise this morning. I've been quite ill last night. She said, we have to go now. Can you come? We're going on a, on a, on a road trip. And I said, on one condition, that you promise me that there are toilets at regular places because I'm not doing very well. And she said, I promise. I said, okay. I got in the car with her and my policeman friend who are now we're good friends and the driver. And we start driving out of the city. I thought, wow, we're going outside Pyongyang. Amazing, exciting, you know? I said, where are we going? And she said, oh, a special surprise for you, Mr. Carter. Not many foreigners go to this place. This is a very secret place. Not many people will see this, what you're going to see today. And I thought to myself, prison. <laughs> anyway, we drove, we went to some checkpoints, they checked our papers, 
And finally, we, we leave the city limits and we head out into the mountains. It was absolutely beautiful. Spring blossom, um, a nice sunny morning. And we went over these enormous bridges over these huge mountain ravines. The bridges had not been taken care of since they were built and there were huge cracks in the road. All the walls had fallen off. There were big motorway roads, cracks in the road where you could see daylight through them and no sides. We're bombing over these bridges and going, and we were driving for about an hour. Now my stomach now is churning. I'm feeling really ill. I said, I need a toilet soon. Can we stop somewhere to go to the toilet? Is there anywhere to go? She said, oh, Mr. Carter, uh, we will arrive in destination within 10 minutes and there you'll find bathroom. I said, okay. We came over this mountain and we came down this sort of pass and in the distance I saw what looked like a prison. It was an enormous, austere, grey looking building with barbed wire around it with a massive flag on the side of Kim Il-sung, who's the founder of North Korea, so Kim Jong-il's father. I said, what is this place? And she said, oh, don't worry, you have good time in this place, very interesting. I said, okay. We finally get to the car park, and the first thing I see are North Koreans in national dress and military uniform coming out in tears, like weeping, 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 weeping. I said, what's going on in there? I said, what, what, what is this place? And she said, oh, don't worry, you have good time in here. You like this place, very interesting. You not many foreigners see this place. I thought, again, prison, you know. So I had to empty my pockets, my wallet, whatever I had, my passport, they had my passport still, my money and whatever. So I emptied my pockets, left it with the driver. And I was taken only by <clears throat> my, male my male counterpart, the policeman, he escorted me in. Now, my stomach was so painful at this point, I felt quite, quite dizzy. So I remember holding onto his arm, uh, literally, I was feeling really rough, weak. I said, listen, I need the toilet really soon. Do you, can we take care of that? He said, yes, yes, toilet break coming in five minutes. As we went in, there were these weird um, air blowers, high pressure air blowers blowing all the dust and stuff off of you. I had to put um, bags over my feet, over my shoes. Now, North Korea is a very poor country, extremely poor. Everything's falling apart. Um, <clears throat> it's gray and crumbling. This building, inside, there was no expense spared. It was like a luxurious hotel. Marble, it was amazing. Nice lighting. I thought, this is really weird. What is in here? Is it a palace? Is it, is it Kim Jong-il's house? What is it? We get into a brand new elevator, enormous elevator like you see in, in Abu Dhabi or in Dubai. And, it, and I'm now with North Korean soldiers and my friend, and now I'm feeling really ill. And I was hoping the toilet was like gonna be within a minute or so. Went up maybe four or five floors, the door opened and there was a huge statue of Kim Il-sung, illuminated in red, with red lights. Now I'd heard that in North Korea, you are at one point or another, you're forced to bow to statues. Now, you know, I'm all up for being cult culturally sensitive and I thought, if it gets me to the toilet, I'll do it. But bowing was very difficult. My stomach was killing me, right? So we all lined up, all these North Korean soldiers who are now becoming quite emotional, and my guide and me. And I started to bow and I said, I said, can we go to the toilet? Now, can we go to the toilet really soon? Because I'm feeling really, really rough. And he said, yeah, in the next room, after the next room, there's a toilet. I said, okay, okay, okay. Well, we're guided into the next room and there in this, in all its splendor, with all this amazing architecture and paintings and marble was the dead body of Kim Il-sung. The leader was, you know, immortalized, if you like, it was a mausoleum. Now in this room, we were, I could see the process. Four people went at each point of his body, two sides, head and feet, and they would bow at the same time and then raise up and they would start weeping, like weeping. Now, here I am, this is not my leader. I don't even know who this guy is. And all I think about is if I break wind, if I fart in this room, they're gonna kill me. And that is so Monty Python. There's a dead bloke in a coffin, looking quite plastic, to be honest. Everyone in the room is in, in tears. Even the guards are weeping. And I just wanna break wind. And I had to now bow four times. So I'm with my guide, he's at the head, I'm at the foot, there's two soldiers here. And I'm now almost like praying, please do not fart. And you know, do you remember when you're at school and you're at the back of the class and you, with your friends and you try not to laugh and because it's so boring what's going on. You try not to laugh. And of course, inevitably, the more you try, the more, you, the more it comes, right? 
So they're at the first, but I'm bowing the first bow and I could feel the wind coming. I thought, oh my God, I, can't, I cannot fart in this room. They'll, they'll shoot me, you know? And I get to the second place, second point of bowing and I bow again. I'm like, oh, please, please, please. It's like so Monty Python, my friends can see me now, you know? I get to the head, I bow again and mount to the side, I bow again. And by now I'm almost staggering out of the room because I'm so, such, in such pain. My guide takes me into the elevator and now I'm in an elevator packed with North Korean soldiers who are weeping. They're like crying and saying all these words about Kim Il-sung. And this music's playing, there's like praise Kim Jong-il music's playing, like military, da, 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 da. And I thought to myself, I'm gonna collapse if I don't break wind. So I, I was in the corner of the elevator and I sat back and I just let it rip quietly. Well, the smell of dead snake is one of the most disgusting things I've ever smelt. And it filled the elevator with this pungent smell. Well, you know when you're a kid and you break wind in a room and it wasn't me. I did the same thing, I was like there. And the soldier turned to me and he said, and he had like tears coming down his face. And I was like, Every day whilst in Pyongyang, I noticed in the big square, something was being, something was happening. There was, they were preparing for some event. The main square in Pyongyang is, is the road where you see all the military vehicles passing by on these big parades. The road is enormous, so it can accommodate tanks. And they started to sort of put barriers around and build a big stage and then big platforms for people to be in. And so I asked my translator, I think on the first or second day, what's going on? Oh, it's uh, Kim Jong-il's birthday and he's having a big party here and there's going to be a choir of a thousand people and an orchestra of 200 people and people will be walking in from villages to, to pay their respects and be at the party. I said, can we go? And she said, well, I can try and get permission. And every day I started hassling my guide. The ambassador told me, if you want to do anything here, you have to hassle them every 10 minutes. So every hour, every so often, I said, can we go to the party? Can we go to the party? And they started laughing. Anyway, on the day of the party, and it was, I think it was two days before I left, I was having my dinner in the hotel and my translator came running in and said, Carter, we're going to the party. I said, great. Got my camera, jumped in the car, drove around to the square, opened the car door to get out the car. And I heard the most unusual sound I've ever heard. When you have a choir of a thousand people singing perfectly in time, perfectly in tune, with an orchestra of 200 people playing perfectly in time, perfectly in tune, there's something about when human beings gather together and do something perfectly, it's very powerful and also very strange because in the Western world, whilst we might be proficient musicians or proficient artists, there's always going to be a bit of imperfection and that's what makes a performance, I think. But in North Korea, everything is so perfect and it's scary. I mean, I was in a kind of a confused state because I've been in North Korea for 10 days or so. I was, I was, you know, um, maybe homesick. I, it'd been tedious, it'd been challenging, frustrating. To hear something so beautiful was very touching. It was really weird. I climbed up the steps and I got to the top, of this now stadium, and I saw the, one of the most incredible things I've ever seen. A sea of thousands of North Korean people in national dress dancing perfectly in time to this perfect singing, singing to the perfect music. And it was amazing. I, I felt strangely touched by this. It was really bizarre. I didn't expect to be moved by this. And it was fascinating. I was ushered into the VIP box. Now there was a BBC cameraman filming this. The ambassador was there and other VIPs, ambassadors. And I stood there for 10 minutes with my camera, but my camera wasn't amazing lens and it was like really far away so I, I just left and walked down the steps and, I, and my guide of course was chasing me and got down to ground level where I could actually take photographs of these people dancing. At one point an old lady she was dancing with a female partner it was really precise it was obviously been practicing for years she just took my hand and pulled me in and taught me this dance and I find myself dancing in a sea of thousands of North Koreans in praise of Kim Jong-il, which is a bit of a bizarre concept, to be honest. I got lost in this dance with these old ladies for a while, and, and then I left and took more photographs and sat and observed this really weird event for a long time. And then the event came to a close, 
There was a big box where Kim Jong-il was supposed to be. He didn't appear. That night on TV, they, they photoshopped him in. So they, they, they basically cut to another scene of another event where he was and he was waving to the people, but he wasn't there for sure. At that time, there had been various threats on his life. There had been an explosion on a train that he was supposed to take, and apparently he hadn't been seen in public for months. So yes, it was, it was a really, really bizarre and interesting experience. And that was towards the end of my stay and was, was, was sort of the clo one of the closing experiences. But the next night, I was invited to the North Korean Arirang Festival, which is a gymnastic festival in the stadium. And, you know, gymnastics is not my thing, really, but I had to go. So there I was in, in a kind of nice VIP area with a good view of the stadium. I have to say, I've never seen anything like it. Lights came up and there were thousands of athletes doing crazy acrobatics, perfectly in time, not a leg out of place. And I, I just thought, this is not human. It's just, what does it take to train people to do that? What threats are made on people's lives to enable them to do this? And what if they get it wrong? What happens to them? It was really crazy. So on one hand, you're really impressed. And my gosh, this is like unreal. And secondly, understanding the darkness associated with that sort of, with that sort of thing. And the point is, the North Koreans wanted to give us foreigners the, uh, you know, the impression that they're amazing people and that they are perfect and they're strong and they, 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 they are together. But with my conversations with my translator, she was a very, um, for a North Korean, very open-minded person. And I would try to ask her very frank questions about their nuclear program, about what do they think of the US. And, and we had some very interesting conversations. And the bottom line is they're programmed to give me certain answers. They cannot think for themselves. And, but her answers were a bit more flexible, but still the bottom line was, this is the party line and this is what we say. So it was difficult to have very deep, open conversations. As we drove around Pyongyang, you see metro stations. And I thought, oh, wow, it'd be cool to go on the metro, right? I mean, it's a normal activity when you visit a, a place. So I'd say to my, my translator, can we go on the metro today? Oh, no, not allowed, not possible. Oh, come on, I need to get permission. Okay, well, can you get permission? Oh, maybe I'll try my best. Every day, can I go on the metro? No. Can I go on the metro? It became a joke, you know, no. Can I go on the metro? Well, on the third or fourth day in the morning, I was kind of like, you know, became like a joke. Can we go on the metro? We can today. At midday, you're going on the metro. It's like, wow, awesome. I mean, imagine being so excited about going on the metro, for goodness sake. So the restrictions were so intense that just the idea of going down those steps to the metro was like, wow, what a day, you know? So at midday, I'm in my reception with my translator and my guide waiting for the escort to go to the metro. A car came, two soldiers and another guy in plain clothes, but obviously who was the boss. We got in this car and we drove to the metro station. We went down into the station and that was amazing. People in Pyongyang never see foreigners in the metro. It just doesn't happen. So imagine, you know, it goes back to the whole like, you know, long hair, colorful trousers, like people like, oh, Who's that? And the metro is so beautiful. It's absolutely gorgeous. All the wooden seats are polished and taken care of. There's no litter. Um, gorgeous, I mean, propaganda, but well-colored murals on the walls. And it wasn't so busy. It was midday, so it wasn't rush hour. And the train came along. We got on the train. And in my carriage were school children, all in gorgeous little uniforms. And I wasn't allowed to take pictures in the metro. But I saw next to me, the, tr the, the, the seats were like this going across. Look to my left and all these little kids were looking like, like looking in a very strange way, like who is that guy in the metro? It was a magical moment. But first stop, we were ordered out. Only one stop was allowed. So maybe they've decorated these two stations to look awesome. The others probably maybe are drastically depressing. And that is what they wanted me to see. I was like, is that it? And they said, yep. We've got to go now. So I was marched out of the metro. The car was waiting. We got in the car and back to the hotel. That was it. My passport was withheld for, for the whole trip, so I never knew when I was going back. I didn't have a ticket. I had a rough idea of the plane time, but never knew when the ticket was for. I came to leave North Korea, and I had really strange, bizarre emotions of leaving. I couldn't wait to get out. That's a given. I couldn't wait to leave. But also, these two people that I've been with every day have been with me, you know, the whole time, and I'd never seen them again. It was like, very rarely in this world do we have that time where we say goodbye to someone and we have an impossibility of contact. It just doesn't happen. So that was bizarre. I had had 
an amazing time. Um, I'd done five concerts for 3,000 people per night. They'd given me an award, a certificate, an honorary diploma from Pyongyang University for my bridge building uh, efforts. And I was leaving with a bunch of stories and experiences, but I couldn't not wait to leave. It was kind of becoming quite restrictive. So, but I still didn't have my passport. And so the car came to the hotel, I checked out, got in the car, got to the airport, and they have a very bizarre duty-free shop at the airport, which of course is only open twice a week because flights only come twice a week. And f phones only come every few months, I imagine. So they turn the lights on and they, they make it look like it's like really busy every day, but actually it's kind of a, you can buy snake wine, the stuff with snake in the bottle, and you can buy some, some um, paintings and things like that. We were standing in the duty-free shop, they gave me my passport and my boarding card, and I hugged my two companions. Um, she was quite emotional, and it was really hard to leave them behind. It was very, very difficult. So I got my phones back, and uh, I got on the bus to the plane, got on the plane, and um, the plane was full of interesting people again, and my Mongolian um, military orchestra, and, which I'd never seen since, actually. I, they were performing at another place. And I sat on the plane thinking, wow, what a trip, you know. And the plane took off, and no incidents, and, and I've, I've had a sleep. Landed in Beijing. Now, culture shock is a very strange thing. Going into North Korea, I was ready for it. I, I, I was so prepared, and meant, psychologically speaking, and ready for, for the changes. And, and I, I, of course, I did feel culture shock, but it wasn't a big thing. I didn't feel like, oh my gosh, what is this place? But leaving North Korea, I'd spent 10 days without phone, without internet, writing a diary every night, reading books, talking to North Koreans. I was, I'd been in another world, and I was not aware of the impact that world had had on me until I left it. I landed in Beijing for a connecting flight to Singapore, and I had a few hours. I couldn't believe how much food there was to eat. I couldn't believe the advertising, and, and so many, I was bombarded with stuff that I hadn't seen for 10 days. Now that doesn't sound like a big deal, but as a Westerner who is used to that, we experience these things all the time, advertising, food, we, you know, we eat generally what we want when we want. And in North Korea, food was limited. I became quite hungry, in fact. So the, the culture shock was coming out, the adjustment of leaving that place. And it took me a while to, to realize what I'd just been through. It was very strange. And arriving in Singapore, again, very Western society, if you like, a lot of, you know, people have money and there's restaurants and, you know, music and you're free. But North Korea planted something in my, in my mind that never left me. The control of people in North Korea is extreme and, and this, this should not happen to people. But then again, there are subtle elements of control that we experience in a Western society every day. As a musician, I, if you turn on Radio 1 in the UK, you are listening to music that's been paid to play. So record labels are paying stations to play the latest songs and those songs go around your mind and finally, if it's a good song, it will sink into your psyche and you might buy it. In North Korea, they pump out military music on the streets every day, day and night. And I mean, honestly, after two days, I became so sick of it. I, I couldn't hear these songs anymore. After the third day, I didn't notice it. After the fourth day, I was singing along. I was singing along these military songs praising Kim Jong-il because it became so familiar and it was like brainwashing. So I think North Korea, it, it, it affected me in a way. And I would go back. I think I would go back in a team not alone, that was challenging. Um, I, I still believe and I stand by the reasons for going. If nobody goes to North Korea, then what difference can be made? And as a musician, I I'm clearly understand that in moments of creativity, in moments of music, people's imaginations can be challenged, can be inspired, and we have no idea what can be planted in people's minds and hearts, if you like, when you play a concert in a place like that. And there may be one kid, if one kid out of those 15,000 people that I played for started to think in a different way, and that could become a future leader, then my job is done. And I think there's no way to gauge what impact you have because you're not allowed to have contact with people in North Korea. But I trust that the fact that something does happen and people are affected, and I will stand by that, saying that I would go back, go back and do it again.